as our first presenter, a uh, member and head of the Memphis Astronomical Society, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the astronomy behind Star Trek and other related topics. Please welcome Mr. Jeremy Velvin. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thought today we would talk about a topic that is certainly a frontier topic in astronomy and science, but still an area of serious inquiry, and actually a theme in a lot of science fiction movies, including Star Trek, at least two of the sequels have, have addressed this topic, and of course that's the topic of time travel. And uh, I've heard from a reliable source, someone who recently heard Neil deGrasse Tyson speak, that Star Trek is the only science fiction film that quote unquote gets it right. So. I don't know if that's true or not, but certainly there's a lot of thought behind the Star Trek episodes, certainly when it comes to some of the physics of Star Trek. But anyway, time travel. It's a theme that we've seen in a lot of science fiction movies. So kind of the key ideas today behind time travel, it's actually something we're doing right now without even really realizing we are actually moving through time. Now, it may not seem like time is going very fast, but we are, in fact, moving through time from the past to the future. It's something we do every day intuitively without even realizing it. But what if I wanted to go forward in time? You know, the human body tends to break down after about 80, 70 years, for some of us, 40 years. <laughs> so how can we go forward? If you, if you saw the New Year's celebration in the year 2000, maybe you want to see it in the year 3000, if it was really cool in 2000. How do we do that before we break down and die? Well, it's very simple. We just got to slow our biological clock down relative to what's going on around us. Those are the concepts that are presented in Einstein's theories of relativity, and it's real science. We're gonna talk about that in this presentation. Now, what if I wanted to see the New Year's celebration in the year 1955? Well, I gotta go backwards in time. In order to do that, I've gotta travel faster than the speed of light. Relativity tells us that that is impossible to do. However, there may be a very, there may be a, a loophole in the equations of relativity called the wormhole. We're gonna talk about that, but it may actually create a portal to travel from one part of the universe to the other or from one part of space-time to another. So theoretically, it may be possible to travel from one part of time to another. Now, two world views. Isaac Newton formulated his laws of gravity, and we still use them today. They work very well for building spacecraft to travel to the outskirts of the, of the solar system. A couple of years ago, New Horizons reached Pluto. Essentially, we used Newton's laws of gravity to build that spacecraft and calculate the laws of gravity to get from here to there. Well, Newton had, 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 in terms of time, Isaac Newton had what's called a God's eye view of the universe. Basically, it didn't matter where you are in the universe, whether you're stationary on Earth or in a spacecraft traveling at a fraction of the speed of light, everything that you saw or measured would be exactly the same. Your concept of time would be the same, your concept of length, your concept of mass, all that would be the same, regardless of where you were in the universe. The idea is that there's absolute time, a central clock that the entire universe runs on. And that prevailed for several hundred years until Einstein came along in 1905, the year that one of my grandfathers was born, and formulated special relativity, challenging the notion that time is absolute. In fact, special relativity tells us that time is not absolute. Everything is relative in the universe because we see everything through the agency of light, which travels at a finite speed, about 300,000 kilometers per second. So in order for us to see what's going on in the universe, we gotta wait for the light to get here. The people that are sitting in the front of the room actually appear older to me than the people in the back of the room because it takes light longer for the people in the back of the room to reach me. Now, we're talking about 20 billionths of a second. The human brain can't process information on that scale, but it still is very real. It's just not something that we are intuitively sensitive to because the human brain and the world that we live in, we tend to see things instantaneously, but that's not how the universe works. What if the people in the back of the room were a light year away? Then events that are occurring right here, right now, as I'm giving this presentation, wouldn't reach them for another year because that's how long it would take for light to travel to them. That's the idea behind relativity. Now, what is a second? Let's get, our, get, get our, our minds around time for a minute, okay? The unit of time. We have an intuitive sense of what a second is based on everyday experience. But it turns out that in the world of science and physics, 
Second, the, con the concept of a second is one of seven fundamental physical quantities. Specifically, at the atomic level, a second can be measured in terms of the number of times that a cesium atom vibrates. In this case, specifically, it's 9,192,631 770 times. Actually, 9 trillion, I said that wrong. 9 trillion, 192 billion, 631,770 times per second, a cesium atom will vibrate. And this is accurate to one second in 1.4 million years. So if we were to build an atomic clock that was based on the vibration of cesium atoms, one of the seven fundamental physical quantities in the universe, it would be one of the most accurate realizations of a unit that mankind has ever achieved. It would be accurate to within one second in 1.4 million years. Extremely accurate measurement of a unit. So that is the concept of a second. Now, what does this mean? All right, we're here at the Fox and Hound. Let's say we had two of these atomic clocks exactly calibrated to each other. We go to the Clark Tower right around the corner. We take one of these atomic clocks and put them at the, at the bottom floor of the Clark Tower and we put another one on the top floor. Let them sit there for a period of time. Now we take them and compare them. It turns out that those clocks are not going to be synchronized anymore. The clock on the top floor of the Clark Tower is actually going to run faster than the clock on the bottom floor of the Clark Tower. And the reason is because the Earth's gravity is actually accelerating the clock on the bottom floor slightly more because that clock is closer to the center of the Earth. So according to Einstein's general theory of relativity, the clock on the bottom floor sees a more pronounced curvature of space-time, which is slowing that clock down relative to the clock on the top floor. What does all this mean? Experimentally, over and over again, we have seen evidence of Einstein's special and general theories of relativity. This is a real phenomenon. How many of you in here have ever used GPS to get from one point to another? I use it all the time, otherwise I'd get lost. It turns out that this, the atomic clocks in the GPS satellites orbiting the Earth are not exactly synchronized to the atomic clocks here on Earth. They have to take into account the relativistic effects of being further away from the Earth's gravity as well as being in orbit around the Earth and traveling. So general and special relativity have to be taken into account in order for those atomic clocks to be exactly synchronized, otherwise the entire GPS system would break down. So concept of time is very relative. Now to illustrate this, imagine a photon clock for a minute. It's very simple. You got two mirrors, photon is bouncing up and down from the top of the mirror to the other. Now in reality this happens several million times in a second, but if we slowed this down, let's imagine that this orange was a single photon. If I throw it up and it comes down, if I can catch it, this is one second. Let's just say hypothetically that's one second. Now we're all in the same frame of reference, so what I see and what you see is exactly the same. But now imagine that I get in a car and I'm driving 100 miles an hour, and you're standing on the side of the road, and you're observing this. Now this is what I see inside the car, but what do you see on the side of the road watching me do this? You're not going to see this, are you? You're going to see a very different path. You're going to see a path more analogous to this path right here. You're going to see the, 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 the orange go down and then bounce right back up. Same thing is true with a photon clock. Now imagine that instead of the orange tossing up and down, I've got a photon clock that bounces up and down. I get in a spaceship and I travel at 80% of the speed of light. You're standing stationary on the Earth and you're observing my clock. What are you going to see? You're not going to see this. This is what I see inside the spaceship. One second. Tick, 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 tick. But if you're observing me in the spaceship, you're going to see tick, tick. The photon travels at a greater distance. So my clock is slowing down relative to your perspective, watching me travel in that ship. And that is the concept of time dilation in special relativity. This is the actual equation. We use this in physics. It can have some fun thought experiments with this, but essentially the time in my reference, I'm inside the ship going 80% of the speed of light, you're on the stationary on Earth observing me, that's what delta T prime is, and the velocity of my ship in this equation right here is going to give me a slower time. Now watch what happens here. 
If I travel at the speeds that we normally travel at every day, 100 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, 30 miles per hour, even 1,000 miles per hour, if I put that term in here and square it, essentially this term here goes to zero, so this whole thing goes to one, so delta T prime equals delta T, which is why we don't sense any effects of time dilation. But if I get up to a significant fraction of the speed of light, this becomes measurable. Let's say I was gonna take a trip to Alpha Centauri. We do this all, you know, we do this in physics class, right? You got two twins, they're the same age, 20 years of age. Twin number one stays on Earth. Twin number two gets into a spaceship, travels at 90% of the speed of light from here to Alpha Centauri. His measured round trip time is about 10 years. 0.9c, you plug that into the equation. He gets back, he's aged 10 years. His twin is his age 22.4 years, something like that. So that's the concept of time dilation. Now this is special relativity. This assumes that you're moving at a constant speed relative to somebody else. Albert Einstein figured out that that's not how the universe works. Things are constantly accelerating and decelerating. So after 1905, he goes back into his lab, six, sits for eight years, and rethinks relativity and comes up with his general theory of relativity that he publishes 10 years later. General relativity has to do, it's, an, it's a completely different theory of gravity. He overthrows 250 years of Newtonian gravity and talks about the curvature of space-time and the presence of matter. It can also be true for accelerated clocks. And we see Einstein's general theory of relativity actually in this movie here. Anybody see the movie Interstellar? Yeah. Kip Thorne the great astrophysicist of Caltech was actually a consultant for this movie. And this is one of the scenes I actually like in this movie. It's a weird movie, as, as a lot of science fiction movies are. There's that scene where they go down to the planet near the black hole. They're on the surface exploring this water world for a few hours. Another astronaut is left behind. By the time they return to the ship where the astronaut is, outside of that gravitational field, that astronaut is aged 18 years. It's a pretty creepy scene. But it's actually true. This is how general relativity works. So we can do another thought experiment with general relativity. Imagine you have Dick and Jane. Dick is 22 years of age, Jane is 20 years of age. Dick decides to devote his life to, si to studying science. Fast forward into the future, relativistic starships have been built, and Dick decides to fly to the galactic center to study the supermassive black hole around the center of the galaxy. Jane is gonna stay behind in mission control. Now, Faster than light travel is out because of relativity. But let's just say hypothetically that you can accelerate this starship up to a very, very high fraction of the speed of light. So Dick gets inside the starship and accelerates at 1G, that's what we feel here on Earth, very, very comfortable acceleration halfway to the galactic center. And then he decelerates 1G and arrives at the galactic center, studies the supermassive black hole for about a year, and then turns around and comes back. Again, accelerating to 1G halfway through the, through the trip, and then decelerating 1G all the way back. Nice smooth trip. Now, in terms of his clock, Dick, it took him 42 years to get from here to the galactic center and back. But Jane, who's back on Earth, her clock is not accelerated. So even though the trip took 42 years for Dick, when Dick comes back, it's 56,000 years into the future. Jane has long since died, and in fact, after a nuclear war, the planet has been taken over by the Morlocks. They're the dominant species now in the year 58,018. Well, that's the concept of general relativity. Now, in order for this to happen, you've got to build a relativistic starship, okay? And this is where science fiction makes the leap. What kind of energy requirements are we talking about here? A 1G acceleration for 10 years, you're going to get very, very close to the speed of light in order for Dick to make this trip. However, the energy requirements in order to do this are extremely massive. To put this in perspective, a hypothetical matter-antimatter drive with about 10% efficiency, you're talking about having to consume 1.5 times 10 to the 13 metric tons of fuel per 1,000 metric tons of payload. Put that in perspective, imagine taking a, a two kilometer across asteroid and consuming it completely from matter into energy. We're not even close yet. I mean, the sun has, you know, it's, it, it uses proton-proton nuclear fusion at its core to convert essentially at 0.03% efficiency. And in doing that, one, one, one gram of hydrogen can fuse into 
into one gram of helium liberates enough energy to lift 64,000 tons of, of rock one kilometer in the sky, or it can sit there and burn comfortably for 10 billion years. So we're talking about an energy efficiency far exceeds what we're seeing in the sun, and we're not even close yet in order to get a relativistic starship to take this kind of journey. So, now what if you want to go back in time, all right? What if you want to build a DeLorean and go back in time and see the year 1955? Well, it turns out that in relativity, you have to travel fast. You've got to make your clock go backwards. And in order to do this, you have to exceed the speed of light. And this is physically impossible. Light speed is the speed limit of the universe. So, but there is a potential loophole in the equations of general relativity there's something called the wormhole. And this is perfectly allowed by general relativity. It's basically a tunnel connect connecting two separate points of space-time. Imagine a rubber sheet where you're digging right through from one end of the rubber sheet to the other. Now, a wormhole, you know, we understand what a black hole is. A black hole is when you have a, a very, very dense singularity that punctures a hole into the fabric of space and time, forming a singularity, a point of of finite mass and infinite density and zero volume. That's what a singularity is. Now imagine if you have two of these things. Two singularities meet, they annihilate each other, and for a brief moment in time, they form a portal called a wormhole. Now, the problem with wormholes is they're not very stable and they don't last very long. They may only last for a fraction of a second, a nanosecond, maybe even a microsecond. The other problem with a wormhole is anything that has quote unquote positive energy is going to cause the wormhole to collapse. You and I are made out of positive energy. Anything, not only, it could be a photon of light, it could even be a fly sneezing that's causing a very, very subtle ripple in the fabric of space-time could cause that wormhole to collapse. So you imagine a hypothetical scenario where you build your starship, you're on the edge of the black hole, you're waiting for the wormhole to form, the two singularities annihilate each other, the wormhole opens up, and then you slam on the gas and you go right through the wormhole, Problem is, you're made out of positive energy, and then the wormhole collapses, the singularity appears, and you get shredded into spaghetti and you die. That's it. That's because you're made of positive energy. Now, there's something in the universe called exotic matter, which has a negative energy density. And theoretically, you could build a starship, maybe, and spray out this exotic matter to act as a shield to hold the wormhole open, creating a stable wormhole, and then you pass through. So you need exotic matter or something made of negative energy density. So that psycho girlfriend or that abusive ex-husband would have an alcoholic problem and just emanated negative energy, make sure you don't get them out of your life because you're gonna need them to make this journey through the wormhole. I'm kidding. Theoretically, it's possible. Now, if wormhole, if, if, if traveling from one end of space-time to another through a wormhole tunnel, from one point in the future to one home in the past is theoretically possible, that brings up a, a number of, of issues and problems and points of discussion. And one of those is the grandfather paradox. And this again is a theme that we see in a lot of science fiction movies. All right, it doesn't seem to bother Captain Kirk or Captain Picard. This was actually the premise of Star Trek First Contact. At least two Star Trek sequels have utilized this concept. But here's the idea behind the grandfather paradox. All right? You have a child. That child grows up to be an evil genius psychopath who invents a way to create a wormhole portal to the past. And then he sends a cyborg back in, in the past with a deep Austra Austrian accent that mysteriously looks like the former governor of California. <laughs> and that cyborg murders your grandfather in the year 1920. Well, if that happens, then if your grandfather is murdered, then how could he have had your father and then subsequently had you in order for you to grow up and have a child that could build a wormhole in the first place and go back in time and murder your grandfather? How can you exist if there's a path for you to go back in time and murder your grandfather? That's the idea behind the grandfather paradox. And Again, I love these movies. I'm a big fan of Back to the Future. I love the Terminator, but in the world of science fiction, you know, you make up the rules as you go. But in the world of reality, these movies never should have been made. They completely violate the rules 
of science. And the audacity to think that you could somehow go back in time and alter your past in order to create a different future, a different destiny for you. So how do we get around this? Well, Stephen Hawking proposed something called the chronology projection protection conjecture, all right? Again, this bothered Stephen Hawking. The grandfather paradox kept him up at night, literally. Here's the idea behind the chronology projection conjecture. The laws of, if the laws of classical general relativity permit the construction of a wormhole time machine, then maybe the laws of quantum gravity, which we do not yet know and do have not yet been developed, could be formulated in such a way that would specifically forbid the construction of a wormhole time machine. The rules of quantum gravity won't allow this. How is that? Quantum fluctuations through the fabric of space-time would cause the wormhole to be destroyed before you intended to send the cyborg back to kill your grandfather. In other words, keeping the world safe for historians. So this gives us a clue going forward as we develop new physics for the 21st, 22nd, and maybe the 24th century that the laws of quantum gravity will not allow this to happen. So that's one way out of the grandfather paradox. There is another way out that's more fun, especially in the world of science fiction, and that's called the many worlds interpretation. Now, in the quirky world of quantum mechanics, there's something called the double slit experiment. Turns out we can slow down, basically the double slit is pretty simple. You got a light bulb here, you fire photons through a double slit, and you observe the pattern that's on the back wall. Is light a particle or is it a wave? If light is a particle, you should see two bars here. Imagine shooting BBs or marbles through the double slit. It's either going to go through the left slit or the right slit. You're going to see, an inter you're going to see a, a clump pattern. But if light is a wave, you're going to see an interference pattern because light is interfering with itself. Well, we can slow the gun down now in the world of quantum mechanics to fire discrete electrons one at a time, boom, boom, through the double slit. But what's really disturbing is even when we do that, we still see an interference pattern on the back wall, implying that the electron is somehow sensing both slits or is going through the slits as a wave. We don't know what's going on. It's weird. But one idea is maybe the electron clones itself before it goes through the slits. So it can be in two different places at the same time. And if electrons can be in two different places at the same time, then why can't we be in two different places at the same time? Because we're made out of electrons. So that leads to the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. The idea that there could be not one universe, but multiple universes out there laying on top of each other, almost like membranes in a, a four-dimensional hyperspace. In fact, you do some of the research on this, the idea there could be as many as 10 to the 500 parallel universes in existence. Now, this is pure conjecture. There's nothing scientific about this, okay? The idea that the universe was born in a quantum fluctuation that we call a Big Bang in a four-dimensional hyperspace, it's a really, really nice idea, and it's great for science fiction. The problem is it's completely and totally untestable and outside of the realm of science. But it's kind of fun to think this through. In one, one, one universe, the Nazis won World War II. In another universe, 9-11 never happened. And, you know, getting back to our Dick and Jane hypothesis, in universe number one, a cyborg pops out in the year 1920, murders your grandfather, and you don't exist. But in universe number two, that cyborg enters the wormhole, disappears, Dick and Jane are born, grandfather lives to be 85 and has 10 grandchildren. So every time you make a decision, you make both decisions. In this universe, you make one decision. In another universe, you make another decision. That's the idea behind the alternative histories hypothesis. Personally, I don't like this one because I think it just kind of, you know, it's a weird idea. But here's the key. Getting back to the grandfather paradox and the chronology protection conjecture, if this is the only way out of the grandfather paradox problem, then maybe this gives us a clue to how we go forward to formulate the new physics. And maybe there is a way in so doing at some point in time in the future to connect one universe to another. And if that is possible, then maybe there will come a time in the future when we can run a series of tests, run a series of experiments, and actually connect a portal from one universe to another. How do we do that? I have no idea. 300 years ago, 
ships would sail from one continent to another using sailboats. They could not have conceived of the kind of technology that we have today. So that's the idea looking forward. As we develop, as we grow, there could be a new series of testable questions that allow us to develop the new physics. So where do we stand in science today? We got the two great pillars of modern science, general relativity and quantum mechanics, and they absolutely hate each other. This is the problem we face today. The rules that govern general relativity are completely different from the rules that govern quantum mechanics. And so the idea is how do you develop a unified field theory, one theory to unify them both. And that gets us to the science of time travel. Again, a lot of this is fun stuff to talk about. It's great plot for science fiction movies, but in terms of the hardcore science behind it, these kinds of, remember, Albert Einstein, when he had developed general relativity, he didn't do it by performing experiments. He basically sat in his lab for eight years, looked out the window, and performed thought experiment after thought experiment. Wrote it down, and then tweaked it. Wrote it down, tweaked it. It's what we call daydreaming. But if you, <laughs> if you perform thought experiments, you can actually come up to some very, very powerful discoveries. That's why Albert Einstein is the greatest physicist in the last 100 years, developing these theories. In terms of time travel, the problems, like the grandfather paradox, the chronology projection conjecture, the, the, the can of worms that it opens up, so to speak, could potentially set the limitations and the boundaries for how we go about developing a quantum theory of gravity. What are the boundaries? What are the rules that we need to stick to in order to move forward? The other idea, again, with general relativity, there's a lot hidden in those equations that has yet to be you know, discovered and, and, and snuffed out. And this actually happened a year after Einstein published General Relativity in 1915. 1916, a man named Carl Schwarzschild dug into those equations of relativity and he, and he found a solution to something called the Schwarzschild radius. The distance from the singularity to the event horizon of a black hole. What he actually found by just digging into the equations of relativity is the existence of black holes by first principles, by theory. Now, we know today, a hundred years later, that black holes are basically ubiquitous throughout the universe. In fact, every major galaxy, including our own, probably has a supermassive black hole at the center. But a century ago, this was science fiction. But they were discovered by digging into Einstein's general theories of relativity. What else is hidden in those theories that has yet to be discovered that could be a key insight into the universe? And so the bottom line is, Science versus science fiction. You gotta draw the line somewhere. Science, what we do as scientists, it's basically, it's not a body of knowledge or a set of beliefs, it's not a creed, a doctor, or anything like that. Science is a procedure. It's a framework. It's how we go about confronting what we do not know. It's a process that we follow, and it's a process of discovery. And that is where this ultimately ties into something as crazy as time travel, because it forces us to ask these questions and perform these thought experiments, ultimately a gain a key insight into how the universe is wired and how it works. And it is strange, and it is wonderful, and it is at times kind of fictitious. But science fiction today could be a reality tomorrow. So that's it. Thank you very much. Is out, or I'm, I'm trying to just. Well, are they trying to time, time travel? Again, there's a difference between what's theoretically possible and what's possible to engineer. So, theoretically, you could engineer a warp drive to compress space time in front of you and stretch it behind you and travel faster than, than light, but the energy requirements to do that are just enormous. Same kind of a thing with um, some of the other concepts within time travel. So. You know, time travel in terms of slowing your clock down relative to everyone else's clock, I mean, in essence, that's already happening, but it's happening on very, very small scales, like fractions of a second. 
to do it where it's noticeably measurable is beyond the reach of our technology right now. I mean, well beyond our reach and may even be to the point where it's, it's, it's un, unachievable, unattainable. But the theories are there to enable us to gain a better understanding of, of the universe. Yes? Right. Repeat the question. It's notice. Yes, it is. Okay. So if you have a, um, what he was asking about. Yeah. Let me repeat the question. Let me go back to the slide here. So the question is in relation to this slide right here. So high precision atomic clocks. Place one in the bottom floor of the Clark Tower. Place one at the flagpole at the top of the Clark Tower. What he was asking is, is the difference in those clocks in terms of being synced initially and then not being synced, you know, put a clock, you put one of these high precision atomic clocks on the bottom floor, put it on the top floor, let it sit there for a period of time and then compare them and they're going to be off. They're not going to be synced anymore. Is that effect measurable? The answer is yes, it is. That's how we know. It would be fractions of a second, you know, either nanoseconds or microseconds. But again, these clocks are so precise that they're only off by one second in 1.4 million years. So they're extremely accurate. It's not only measurable here, if you put one in a spacecraft that travels at supersonic speeds, again, they're synced initially, but after that, the journey of that aircraft, and you compare those clocks, they're going to be off. Or if you, how long? If you took one journey, like let's just say, you know, a day, it, it wouldn't take years, it would take maybe, uh, you know, a day or two, and you would actually see the measurable differences in those clocks. And it's not only true for atomic clocks, it's true for your Timex watch too. Anything, any timekeeping device is absolutely relative. There is no such thing as absolute time. All time is relative. Yes? Will time travel be possible in our lifetime? <laughs> well, I don't see anybody from the future walking around here or anybody from the past. It's one of those things where I'll believe ET exists when I shake his hand. I'll believe time travel Time travel is possible when somebody comes up to me and says, here's who's going to win the national championship in 2018, and they're absolutely right, and they can fill out this bracket from one point to the next and get zero wrong. Because the probability of doing that, if you were to fill out all the different possibilities of the NCAA bracket, one per second, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it would take you 292 billion years to exhaust all the possibilities. So bring me a human being before next year's March Madness so we can get them all right and say, I'm from the future and I'll be convinced. <laughs> Anybody else? You have a question, please? Oh, no, I was just trying Would to take an ERD. Would you explain the instruction of a transporter process? <laughs> <laughs> a transporter process. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably you do that. You can do that. Oh, man. So you're talking about beam me up, Scotty, is that right? Okay. So here again is where science fiction takes a, a, a remarkable leap. Um, basically, I've got to take all the mass of my body, convert it into pure energy, turn that energy into a beam, and take me from point A to point B. So I don't have to get in my car and drive home, right? Just beam me home and I'm there in, in a second or two. It works really well in Star Trek. Here's what has to happen. First of all, I've got to break down every atom and molecule in my body, and then I've got to store all the information of every atom and molecule in my body into a computer. That includes every electron, every subatomic particle, the spin of every electron, the superposition of every spin of every electron, everything, all that information. That all has to go into a computer, and then it has to be stored for a brief second, and then I've got to break myself down and then rebuild myself and put myself back together. What type of a computer are we talking about? Imagine a terabyte hard drive. That's a trillion bytes of data. Now imagine enough tera hard, terabyte, terabyte hard drives to fill one entire Empire State Building from top to bottom. Now imagine doing that 500 million times. And that's how much information is stored in the human body. That's just the data. 
So I need 500 million Empire State Buildings worth of one terabyte hard drives just to store all the information that's in the human body. In addition to that, I gotta break myself down. Well, if you converted all the mass of my body into energy, that's gonna be the equivalent of about 42 of the most powerful nuclear bombs ever exploded on the planet Earth. That's how much energy is in my body. And then there's the even more difficult problem. That is, what's to say that if you do that to my body, break my body down, put, turn it in energy, and then build me back up again, wouldn't that be the same as killing me and resurrecting me? Or couldn't you just break me down, store me into a computer for a while, and then revive me 100 years into the future? So, Scotty. yeah. <laughs> that whole beaming thing, I'm a little skeptical that that's ever going to happen, too, to say the least. So that's, that's a big problem. Yeah. How do you feel about coming into a room full of Star Trek fans? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking it's 1 o'clock, and I'm at the Fox and Hound, and I haven't eaten all day, and I'm starting to feel pretty hungry. So I'm looking forward to getting some lunch. I'm, I'm, I've had my eye on her for a while, so she, I think she wins the, the contest. The best Trekkie contest by far, so you guys got up your game a little bit. All right, guys, thank you very much.